Thanks very much, Janet. Um, it's a real pleasure to be reading um, at Poets and Players again, and it's great to see such a terrific crowd on what is such a miserable afternoon um, outside. I thought I'd start by reading two poems um, from my last book, um, Of All Places. It may well be the last time I'm going to be reading these poems for quite some time, because as Janet said, I have a new book which is going to be published at the end of May, um, the way in which I'm going to read from later. But this first poem is called Old Style, um, and I'd like to dedicate it to Linda Chase, a friend to many of us here, who was the uh, founding spirit for poets and players and for much else that was good and healthy um, uh, for poetry in Manchester. Old Style, not just the lay-by or the motorway or its central reservation, not just the ring road or the cul-de-sac with its pretty Versailles border, not just the house or its extension and its hundred windows shining away. Instead, the known world and the unseen to which you'll come back. That is the point of departure, the destination and all points in between. A free drift to nowhere in particular, all that way and back again. This poem is called Aerialist, um, and it's a, it's a longish uh, narrative poem. Um, I suppose it's one of the poems in the last book that gave me ideas for the kinds of things I was going to try to do um, in this new book. Um, it's uh, dedicated to the memory of Vitaly Karapovitsky, who was an aerialist. He was a clown who uh, died in a performance um, of a circus in the west coast of Ireland. Aerialist. I talked us all back to Ireland, a week in Kilorglan, and a plan to take shovel, bucket, armbands, and an inflatable fin, a picnic basket, and a tartan rug to a different beach each mid-morning. It was quiet, and it all worked out. So much, we might have dreamed it and never gone. Except that one day we parked on Inch Strand and ploughed it up as the tide around us did what it does. Cooked up inside at night was a different prospect in a rental no one could pretend was Bali or Venice. For entertainment, ice cream vans and posters for a circus. Not exactly an infrastructure. The Royal Russian Circus. 20 euros ahead. I cursed the Celtic tiger and paid cash at the till, wishing briefly I'd stayed, done an MBA and some violence to the language, lived it deal by deal. Every artist looks after his own props. The balloon exploded into flames, the cage fell, then the heavy steel ball. Becoming witnesses, one or two hundred people thought it was part of the act. Fire as magic, whoosh and clatter. Nothing irregular in the mid-air routine. The reports say he was Belarusian, 26, a clown or an aerialist in a clown costume, and that he threw his wife clear. We'd seen in Ross Bay pre-show and a week earlier hanging around nerveless and going nowhere, an elephant, a giraffe, and between them a zebra. Canvas and steel were shaped into a marquee, and from behind Queen Saharan, glider after glider hung in the sky, coasting away clear to the north. A new bungalow advertised art, another a scuba school, and night kayaking in the phosphorescent ocean, by which that night stars and stripes on each enormous brow, the elephants balanced on buckets like shuttlecocks, while the giraffe nodded, stately and gawky, and a shabby lion made his unheard of roar, still a memory on each nearby farm. A crowd of method actors, the circus animals, though instead of a tiger, the MC for the sake of form squirted water at us from a flower between acts. The Sadovs had performed for one year and had one stunt. In it, he couldn't find her. She fooled and hid. The story so simple, we gripped the wooden ringside, grinding our heels into the matted grass and, would it ever end, opened our mouths like parents as he kept falling over and out of the hot air balloon. Over and over he went, poor man who would throw his wife clear. Weeks later, and back across the water, I saw online the Dublin owner of the Royal Russians, or its spokesman, speak of close-knit community, the harness, the hoist, and the families of the deceased and bereaved flying over. 
It seemed for a while here as if things might be as they were, autumn closing in, a net that at the last moment would come apart, taking only the leaves from the trees and the name of the year. Okay, so this is my uh, proof of, uh, of, of my new book. Um, so I'm very excited to be reading from it. As Janet said, I, I haven't read these poems before. Um, and I'm going to start off with a, a poem called uh, On Earth. Um, it's got uh, two references in it. One is to the movie Boyhood, um, which some of you might have seen last year. Um, and then the other is to a word called Petrikar, which I came across. And it's um, a word um, which I had never seen before, and it describes the smell of hot stone drying after rain. Do you know, do you know that smell? Yeah, I thought, how amazing to have a word for that. Um, so that's, that's, the word, that's the word that's in the poem. I use my sheet. On Earth. At the bus stop under the horse chestnut, we tally the length of boyhood against the babysitter's plans for later and, waiting, see the leaves have started to wilt, brown at their July edges, losing a little of spring's climb upward. Afterwards, emerge from the dark into a thunderstorm, we see out the trees arching welcome to spikes of lightning, its base flooding, growing into reduced circumstances, swelling up but still about. Is this what it means to be someone? I'm not saying anything, but 24 hours later, the smell in the air is of rain drying off stone, petrichor, the tree's slow and seasonal evaporation, a way of answering to a day, to years of them, that we step into and speak up for, to you. There is no one else I am talking to. This poem is called Astronaut. Um, and it, in spite of its title, it doesn't have any, any astronauts in it. Um, sawing in half the cast iron bat the house was built around so that he can ship it in parts downstairs and out to the skip they've hired. Neil, who is putting in the new electric shower, says to her, the heating's gone off now and the water too, but I'll come back later. Climbing much later into bed after her night on call in the freezing north, she starts to ask him, her husband, if Neil did return, that is, from wherever it was he went with the bath in pieces. When she finds he is dead to the world with herself beside him, so begins the careful, gravityless stepping around of an astronaut, discovering on the bedside table between how-to books and the baby's bottle the thermostat he must have fallen asleep trying to reset, the temperature setting as the unfolded booklet says, unknown but read by the alarm's red glimmer closer to the second of its two settings, not the one called sun or comfort, but moon, which it says could be described as off. A noise in the pipes on the other side of the wall where the old bath was that she ignores, along with the distractions of the rain and the state of the discarded floor. A sea of disappointment, it is as impossible to float away from as it is to understand in this light, at this hour, the word commissioning, or performing the initial power-up, or asking by the light of her phone how to set the timer when it is too late to set the clock. Everything, everyone is leaving. The door is shutting behind her like the set sun, and the idea of comfort as she exits a week of nights for a week of nights is not what anyone is after in the shortening days they are aimed for. Within one minute, the old set values she is turning in her sleep now must be checked, and there is no one to whom this can be reported. 
the equipment, what's left of it, will persist. From now on, as before, she is on her own. Downstairs next morning, the house is warm, they're all out of bed. He's put the thermostat in the fridge and boiled the last of the water with milk for a restoring coffee. The big two are in their uniforms and ready for road. By the skip in the drive, he stands with the buggy, scarfed and gloved, taking in instructions for the day ahead. What to say to Neil, we need milk. What needs taking out of the freezer? When to call, all my love. And a poem from the same world as that one. Um, this poem is called Shed. I bought the shed for a song off a neighbour who'd stopped using it after he paved the garden. He'd inherited it or got it somewhere he couldn't remember, not that I gave a second thought to its origin. It was heavier than it looked, so he helped take the roof to pieces. After an hour, prying out each crooked tack, we levered off its grey-green sandpaper stiffness and rested it on the drive like a book stranded on its back. The neighbour, looking at his watch, said, let's push, and the four walls moved a little. In front of the garage, sweating, feeling each ounce of the previous night, we saw too late it was too big to go through. We counted the nails, but couldn't. They were like stars, more the more we looked. Heave it over, over the garage, and down he joked the garden path to its resting place under the magnolia. No joke. We made a ramp of the ladder and inched this half-ton pine crate up and out of the road. The scraped flat garage roof pitched under our careful feet. Two euphoric beers later, after we'd lowered it into place, we agreed on twenty quid. Every so often, he still calls in. Today, he's selling up and getting out. He asks about the shed. I say it's fine so half-hidden by April gusts of leaf and petal, he can hardly see it, as we look out the window at where it leans against the fence, painted green, the unlocked door opening on the lawnmower and half-full cans of paint and petrol, pure potential evaporating into the air. But work makes work. Paving the lot, he volunteers, makes more sense. I'm offering him a cup of tea, when, before he can collect himself, he starts to resent the twenty quid and leaving the shed behind. It was, he says, almost free. <laughs> so one of my favourite bits of the readings here is having people walk in not knowing what they've walked in on. You know, <laughs> feel free to walk down if you, if you like. Um, in the middle of this new book, um, I suppose as a, an Irish writer who's been living in Manchester for 11 years now and in England for a little bit longer than that, um, I've always been uh, writing about both places at once um, and with an imagination that is emigrant um, whether it wants to be or not. So the poems are as likely to land up in Manchester as they are um, in Kerry or elsewhere. Um, and the big trunk in the middle of the, this book is a long sequence um, from which the title poem comes, which starts off in a pub in Withington um, and circles through both countries before um, ending back there. And the structure I took for this 15 poem sequence was from a, uh, a little known poem, a poem which I expect nobody to read, um, Edmund Spencer's um, poem, Colin Clout's Come Home Again. I think it's fantastic. Um, when I mentioned it to my publisher, he said, I'm not gonna read that, you know, <laughs> so. Um, the title poem is, call, is, a, is one, of the, one of the stopping points um, for the sequence. I'm finding out now the value of a book as I shuffle these pages around um, and lose my place in them. At one o'clock, the old men, and at three o'clock, two. At four o'clock, a stone stairway and the sea old airs and the lure of a fiddle in an echoing hall. At six, the window fixed and with a green sill. What's done and said is clear from the bare table at which the men sit. At eight, the bar 
which will go till 10, then a tower, the introduction of a border, and the extended home whose courtyard a swineherd crosses. In the hallway, velvet gloves, water bottle, a black lace fan embroidered with ghost orchid and dog rose. Inside, a sofa from the 90s, parked by an image of a boggy little stream, whose names and days are numbered in a plan I'm looking up from. Almost midnight, and there are things right here for which there are as yet no instructions. The door, the boat, the way out, the only way in. Okay, so the, um, there, are, there are some of my, some students of, who have uh, been in my classes over the last few years um, and who might know or might remember my fondness um, for a French Uruguayan poet called Jules Superve, um, whose poems I first read in a uh, translation um, by uh, Moniza Alvi, um, which my friend Evan Jones lent me. And I loved this uh, poem in uh, Moniza Alvi's translation. Um, and then, uh, in my bad French, realised that she had rhymed it and Minis Alvi hadn't, and I thought, oh, here's an opportunity for me to take this poem um, and, and, and rhyme it and, and set it going um, as I read it. And it's a poem in which this uh, Uruguayan-born poet um, living in France uh, imagines uh, the moment of his conception. And it's called Montevideo. I was being born, and at the window, passing by, was the horse pulling the plough in from the brightening edge of the far field, a mosaic which, tile by tile, the light revealed. Who was driving it? Whoever was up woke the day with a little pop of his whip. Night's other element, an archipelago afloat above the day he had started. Walls raising themselves from the sand and cement and river gravel that had waited in them, sleeping tight. A little bit of soul, my soul, slipped by, along a blue rail, a line in the sky. And another bit folded itself into a sheet of paper, under sail, adrift, till it lodged under a stone, its wildness caught and settled down. The morning counted its birds, never losing its place. That sweet honeysuckle smell gave itself to the morning's blue swell. In Ireland, on the Atlantic, the air was so affable, such a tonic, that the colours of the horizon came closer to see the houses we lived in. It was me being born, there where the woods almost speak, on whose paths the grass grows, surely, but not too quick. Underwater, equally, seaweed and algae bob and wave. The wind, too, will fall for them, they make believe. Earth, always about to begin again its orbit, recognises us in its atmospheric dips, feels in the wave and in its profoundest deeps, the swimmer's head, the diver's feet. I'm going to finish with um, a ballad, uh, I think it's a ballad, I don't know what else to call it anyway, um, and it's called The Penny, um, uh, like a bad penny, bad penny. I mustn't have sunk it in the water after I found it behind the shed, because here it is the penny, back again in my pocket, or it fell out anyway. So getting out of bed, it was there, shiny-eyed, on the carpet. It's nothing, and don't make it into something. Just a penny, a little coin that wouldn't stick. Don't make out it's a sign, or has a meaning, like a bottle imp, or some unquenchable storybook candlestick. Okay, but you see me try to give it away, a tip for that terrible chowder we stopped for earlier, by the lake, do you remember, the day before yesterday, and it came back staring up at me from the saucer. I remember and the waiter is looking back at you as if that were a tip. I'm getting up, I hear someone calling. Forget it, this is a holiday and there's enough to worry about without this carry-on. I'll just leave it right here. No point is there in doing anything else and after we've left, then we can see if it's all square. If it stays here on the counter, 
or if it is something daft, you'll see we'll turn around a mile from the door for the camera or a toothbrush or battleship or a passport the kids made a game for. If it's gone or makes it home before us, will it be got up or if it looks up, becoming useless from the dash as we embark, what look will you shoot me in the below decks dark? Thank you.